Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Competitive Enterprise Institute. My name is Alex Reinauer. I'm a research fellow for the Center for Tech and Innovation here at CEI, and it is my pleasure to be able to moderate this event entitled A Global Antitrust Paradox. Um, we currently have two revolutions occurring simultaneously. Well, at least one actual revolution and I think one attempted revolution. Uh, first, we have a technological revolution surrounding artificial intelligence. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of investment, both public and private, going towards this technology. Uh, we're just beginning to see the way it's going to change uh, our lives, and for the better, I think. Uh, next, there is an attempted revolution going on at the antitrust agencies. Um, there's Chair Lena Khan at the Federal Trade Commission, as well as Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor at the Department of Justice. And they're both seeking to revitalize the antitrust laws to apply them to large technology companies who they see have accumulated too much power in the economy. Uh, and there's a tension between these two phenomena. One that is explored in a recent paper published by Joe Sullivan, well authored by Joe Sullivan, published by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, and that paper is the inspiration for today's event. So I'd like to int uh, introduce our panelists. We have Joseph Sullivan, Senior Advisor at the Lindsay Group, a global macroeconomic advisory and consulting firm. Uh, he previously served at the White House Council of Economic Advisors as both a staff economist uh, as well as a special advisor to the chairman from 2017 to 2019. Uh, we are also joined by Neil Chilson, head of AI policy at the Abundance Institute. He is a former chief technologist at the Federal Trade, Commis Trade Commission, as well as an attorney advisor to then acting FTC chair, Maureen Allhausen. Uh, Neil is a lawyer, he's a computer scientist, works a lot at the intersection of law and technology, so we're happy to have both of them here today. Uh, as a roadmap first, we're gonna talk just very briefly, generally about AI and the technology, what it is, what, what's its uh, implications, or what's its applications. Uh, next, we'll briefly also talk about antitrust inquiries at the DOJ and the FTC, as well as probably talk about the EU. Uh, and then finally, round up the conversation with the discussion of the global antitrust paradox its domestic implications and its international implications. Uh, first, Neil, I'd like to talk to you about what is AI? I know we're, we're hearing a lot of different definitions being thrown around. Uh, and I think you've written a lot about this on how to think about it and what, what is it comparable to maybe uh, from things we've seen before. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be back at CEI. Um, so there, the first thing to know about AI is uh, there is no scientific consensus on the definition of AI. Um, it's a very broad term. And in fact, it's, a, it's an area of study that is almost as old as computer, computing itself. Um, I remember when I was a kid just getting into programming computers, cutting edge artificial intelligence was games. Um, so getting a computer to play chess at like a skilled level was cutting edge a artificial intelligence at one point. Now everybody's phone can probably beat you, you know, 100 times out of, or 99 times out of 100, it'd be 100 times out of 100 for me, um, uh, at chess. And so the definition of AI has changed as computing has changed. Um, every time something works, there's a famous computer scientist who said, every time it works, we stop calling it AI, and it's just computing. Um, and that that's held up pretty well. We have this new wave of, um, machine learning, and in particular, this type of deep learning algorithms that are, have been around for a long time, but a bunch of things have come together to make them useful in a way that they hadn't been in the past. And they look a little different in how you and I use them. And so I think there's a perception that all of a sudden AI is everywhere. But this type of generative AI is a small subset, and machine learning is a small subset of the bigger um, framework. And so uh, when we talk in the policy space, it's a giant challenge for people who are trying to regulate AI because getting this definition really ma right really matters. If you define it too vaguely or too broadly, you're basically sweeping in all of computing. Um, and I think most people don't think that that's what they want to do. Uh, we did have a, a recent research paper published at Abundance Institute 
um, had a couple um, scholars look into and pull all the definitions of AI, all the potential definitions of AI from legislative language. And they found over 5,000 different def definitions across federal and state uh, proposed legislation. And so this is a real challenge um, for the policy space to get these definitions right. Um, but I think conceptually, it, it's also a big challenge as, as a culture we try to figure out what we mean when we talk about AI. So much of the, so much of the stuff that's on this phone um, would have been AI just a couple years ago. Um, and now we just call it, you know, oh, it tells me whose photo that is. And, uh, and it can read text. Um, all of that was cutting edge AI research just a few years ago. So I, I think basically what I said is there is no good definition of AI, um, but there is a new wave of very interesting computing tools that learn from data rather than being programmed by humans. And I, I, Neil, I hear the phrase AI stack mentioned a lot. Uh, I guess that's just a fancy way of talking about you know, the different vertical elements of AI. Can you just give us a brief discussion? What, what, what is all included in the AI stack? Yeah, so uh, stack is a term in computer science or, or computer architecture uh, that talks about all the different elements that might um, interface underneath your, your user program that's at the very top. This would be the chat GPT, the application that you're typing into. Um, underneath that, there is a model, an AI model. Um, there's a bunch of other plumbing in there too. I'm really deeply simplifying here, but uh, there's an AI model that was trained on a bunch of data. And then that model runs on hardware, right? So those, those hardware, uh, that hardware consists of giant data centers, but in those data centers are lots of chips. And so uh, that's kind of the basic division. You have these, these specialized chips. You have these computers that run, that have many of these chips in them. You have these data centers that have many of the computers in them. You have the software that runs on top of that. And there's lots of variation within that. And, and at the very, very top is the thing that, computer, that, that users use um, that's called the user interface. And so yeah, that's, that's, that's really the great. stack. That's really great. Uh, Joe, I want to bring you in here sure. to talk about a little bit about the economics of this. And I, I know in your paper you discuss just a, a tremendous amount of private investment are going into these technologies. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about that and just anything else you think we need to know about artificial intelligence? Sure. Um, thank you, Alex. I think the best analogy to AI um, might be the internal combustion engine back in, say, 1900 or, or, or 1905 when it was clearly transformative, but the applications for it were not yet knowable. And so I think that clarifies just the stakes of getting this right. Right, I mean, in 1905, one could have banned cars, because cars were a safety risk, and that would have been catastrophic. So I think we're at a sort of similar inflection point now with regards to AI. Um, and I think just the scope and the scale of private investment um, tells that story because you can get numbers in the tens to hundreds of billions of dollars per year going into AI. And the return on that investment will both be quite consequential for the economy and in part a function of what happens here in Washington. So I think it's hard to overstate the stakes of, the, of uh, getting the policy right here. Yeah, just uh, I guess one part of the AI stack that's not talked about is energy, right? And there's a, there's a big discussion uh, in the country right now about data centers and the amount of energy uh, they need. And I think here at CEI, we talk a lot about energy abundance and our need to unlock the potential of United States energy. So uh, what's the kind of intersection there with, with energy policy and, and, and AI policy? Uh, it's a really great question. Um, so yeah, that's even further down from the chips, right? The chips yeah. use a lot of electricity, right? These data centers use a lot. Now, it's hard to get, you have to calibrate this conversation exactly right because it's in a trend. <laughs> Part of the challenge is we're in a trend in the US where we sort of flattened on energy production starting around the 70s. We, we started conserving rather than building more capacity. And so um, the US totally has the capability to build sufficient energy for data centers. But we shouldn't just sit around and do nothing. We need to do it. But it would put us back on the trend line that we had been in the pre-70s era where of building, you know, yeah, it's like 6% more capacity year over year, which is totally doable. This is not a crisis, 
Um, these things aren't going to like turn out your lights because they're, they're taking up so much energy. But we do need to do stuff because these, this technology is very powerful. And we didn't really, I mean, yeah. the, by analogy, we said, you know, the, obviously the, in, uh, the internal combustion engine was important and very powerful. We can all think about how that was useful. Artificial intelligence is useful because intelligence is useful. Um, and it supplements that. And so all the things you could solve, you can solve challenges with, with human intelligence, um, AI helps make those things better, quicker, and it helps us deliver new, new products and new services faster. And so it is a general purpose technology that will have applications across every industry. So it's really important that we get this right. And energy is a key part of that. Yeah. Do you want to weigh in at all? Um, I think that's exactly right. I think getting more energy will multiply the returns on investment that are happening across the stack. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, next, I'd want to talk a little bit about the antitrust inquiry, inquiries that are, that are occurring right now, right? I think we have uh, a 6B order that the, uh, that the FTC gave, you know, a, a number of different players in the field. Um, you know, the, we had the deal that was between the FTC and the DOJ to separate enforcement authority. Uh, Joe, just first, gonna just talk a little bit about the landscape here, what, what's going on, and then I'll, I'll give Neil also time to, to talk about it. Um, sure, there's been pretty active antitrust enforcement from both the FTC and the DOJ. And I think just looking at the mergers um, that they've stopped, which already is pretty bad, tends to understate that, because it seems like there's a lot of companies that are contemplating mergers and just walking away, right? So it doesn't even get to the PR announcement. So I think you're seeing a really big chilling effect from just how unprecedented and how aggressive the FTC and the DOJ are being. And so there, there, there are some um, cases in the paper like NVIDIA and ARM, ARM. Um, NVIDIA is obviously quite consequential right now, both in the stock market and the real economy. So the fact that their plans are already getting scuttled, I think, is a pretty big indictment of how costly the status quo has been. But again, just the announced case, uh, just the announced mergers that have been walked back, would lead you to a misleadingly low impression of how costly the current regime is. Yeah, I think the attitude has been um, in entirely one of skepticism of this industry. It's been. I remember I read the first uh, blog post out of the FTC that was on competition and AI, and it literally lists out all the possible competition problems that could be in this like exploding um, industry of new companies and new investment. There are big companies involved here, but there are hundreds and hundreds of companies. Mm -hmm. AI as a general purpose technology is, uh, the applications are really wide ranging. Um, you know, and there's lots of people trying to get in on all these different verticals. And so the, the fact that the first intuition, the first inkling of these agencies was to say, hey, here are all the potential competition problems, uh, I think just speaks volumes about how they think about the world and how they think about the world of business. And so uh, a lot of that, that, you know, from that first blog post, there's been lots of activity. You mentioned six Bs. These are industry-wide studies where um, the FTC doesn't have to have uh, any sort of case open, but they'll just say, hey, named companies, give us all these types of information because we want to understand what's happening in your industry. And so they have this AI, they have this AI one that's looking at agreements between different companies, but then they had this uh, cloud provider one that is very related in many ways, uh, just to look at the, the companies that provide cloud services. Um, there's been... Uh, there's, even a, there's even a joint statement that the FTC and the DOJ did with a bunch of European uh, antitrust authorities that says, hey, we're worried about competition in the AI space. Again, I'm not sure why Europe is worried about it. They just have one company. But um, sorry, that's a bit of an exaggeration. But, um, uh, but uh, and so, so I think there's a bunch of, there's a lot going on. Um, and we've seen it even in uh, a lot of concern about, say, NVIDIA, who has, because they have been thinking about this issue for a long time, 
developed a technology that is very good for this specific type of computing, and now everybody wants to buy their product, and somehow that's seen as a competition problem. That's called success. I don't know. Yeah, and I want to I want to ask about <clears throat> Nvidia specifically, right? Because in the late '90s, early thousands, right? I used to to build you know PCs with my dad, and Nvidia was we, we were building them for gaming computers, yeah, right? right um, and I don't think anyone could have anticipated that this company that was really just only known to this, this subsect of just technologists who built computers and built gaming computers and were playing games on these, these new machines, that it, it could become this really pivotal uh, company in, in the AI space. So is, is there anything we can, we can gather from that to say like, look, we, it's, we can't predict the future here. We couldn't predict NVIDIA was gonna become this powerhouse and we, we can't predict what's gonna happen with AI. Necessarily, I, I, yeah. I yeah, absolutely. It's it, you know, there are some people, and I, I think this is the nature of entrepreneurship. Nvidia, for a long time, had sort of had this vision that that their type of like massively mul uh, massively distributed computing, parallel computing, uh, would be a very key part of computing in the future. Um, and but they moved, you know, through gaming and video and graphics into like. Crypto, that was another app, big application that drove a lot of purchase, and now AI. And so I, I think that they had some foresight there, but lots of other companies are jumping into even the chip space. And so when we, when we look at NVIDIA's success um, and the fact that they are, they are making a lot of money right now, there's a lot of people who want a slice of that pie and they're building their own chips. I mean, every single, big tech companies basically building their own chips in this space. And there's a bunch of people who are trying to come up with new ways to uh, not have to use as many chips and to have more efficient algorithms. So I, I think we're seeing a very competitive result here. Um, and I, I think it's just a, another sign that not just, I mean, the current competition authorities sort of think of things as competition generates innovation as if you just have X number of companies and you make that number more that you'll get more innovation. Um, but it's kind of more the reverse. In fact, the types of like disruptive innovation that we want, disruptive innovation causes competition. And so you see a company like Google who had developed the some of the basic algorithms in this space, hadn't really launched a product until ChatGPT came out that was as forward facing. And so they, you, know, you already see, you suddenly see Microsoft and, and Google like rushing to get stuff out the door that maybe they had not been rushing to get out the door before. And so that's a competitive result. I think it's great. And I've been talking way too much. Sure, yeah. I <laughs> Speaking guess, of competition, yeah. yeah. Oh. I'll cede the floor, <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you, Neil. Um, <laughs> I, I guess my only point would be that um, if, if there's a company today that could be NVIDIA in, say, 20 years, the FTC and DOJ right now are casting such a broad net that's so antithetical to mergers, companies expanding, getting acquired, that NVIDIA today might not exist if Lena Khan were in a time machine, went back 20 years, and so forth. Um, yeah. So that's a sort of scary counterfactual, is what are we missing today due to overly aggressive antitrust enforcement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I know there's there's a discussion here specifically antitrust inquiry specifically into AI, uh, but Joe, you talk about a little bit in the paper about how just some more general antitrust attacks against tech companies can ultimately affect investment in AI. And, and one example you you address in the paper uh, is the antitrust case against Google. Um, yes. And as we all know, we we recently got uh, a decision held down on on the merits, but not on the on the remedy. Um, so can you talk about that? You know, how potentially if, if Google, if there's some extraordinary remedy here and, and Google gets yeah. hopefully not broken up or, or loses revenue, how is that going to affect sure. their investment in AI? So um, companies generally need profits to make investments. Google will plausibly lose revenue from this decision. That loss of revenue will make it harder for Google to make big investments in AI, and that might have downstream effects on the whole series of companies that would have benefited from the investments that Google now can't afford to make. And so, Neil, to your point about the overall stack, right? What's at stake is not just Google's bottom line, but all the, the sort of uh, ecosystem of technologies that might evolve around that. And so I, I think one thing that's often lost in discussions is that tech companies generally um, fund most of their investment from their own earnings. 
They don't issue tons of debt or tons of new equity generally. So to the extent that the FTC is causing a hit to their earnings, they are harming the entire AI tech system sort of now and down the line. I don't know, Neil, if you have anything to... Uh, I mean, less on the economic side, but more on just the, the legal side. The, the decision that came down um, is, is sort of extremely formalistic in its application of what I would say is pretty standard antitrust. Um, but, but you know, for the conversation that we're having here, there was some discussion of the decision about whether or not AI, uh, say, search capabilities, like asking ChatGPT for a, a question instead of asking like the Google search engine, um, whether or not that was a competitor. And the court had a you know a very like clear like, it had a line where it drew for what companies fit into the general search engine category. And it said, well, those are outside of this category, and so they don't count. Um, and I think that's a very simplistic way to think about competition in a market that's as interconnected as this, where it's pretty clear that there is some draw. And I think that the, the 10 blue links like model that has been Google's sort of go-to for the long, a long time may not, there's no guarantee that that's the way that people try to access information in the future. And so, um, you know, the court like very formally said, hey, they're not in the market and kind of dismissed those AI competitors. Uh, but I think that's a mistake. And I think there's some chance that like we look back at this uh, decision, which, you know, may or may not hold up on appeal uh, and say, hey, that was kind of wrong. Yeah. And this, this reminds me of a previous case that I think we can look back to and say, you know, what was the, the FTC thinking yeah. was... Uh, uh, Hollywood Video and the Blockbuster merger, right? Which were, <laughs> which was, which was blocked by the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, I think Google's doing a little better than Hollywood yeah, no, Video I, you know, was. But, certainly, yeah. certainly. But at least you know they 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 secluded the market, saying you know though this is physical, and they That's left exactly out right. you know Netflix, and, and and all of a sudden we look back and we have streaming, and it's a completely different atmosphere, right? We don't have physical tapes right. anymore. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting. Uh, finally. I want to jump into the real meat of this conversation, which is the global antitrust paradox. And we're going to separate the discussion domestically and internationally. Uh, so first, domestically, right? What, what are the kind of implications here by this really just over aggressive antitrust enforcement in the US? Uh, and what kind of that effects is going to have domestically here, Joe? Um, sure. So what I did was I assembled um, a pretty big data set with data from the World Bank on things like real GDP and inflation that economists find very exciting. I know, don't get too excited. And then I, I found data from two professors, one at the University of Chicago and one at Columbia, about the stringency of competition policy. So I merged those two and looked at what happens when all else equal, a company or a, a country goes from being less stringent to more stringent. The answer is that you, on average, get higher inflation and lower real GDP growth. And so in a world where the sort of lines between economic and security competition blur, what that means is that as the US tries to grow and compete with China, for instance, that the US, if Lena Khan were successful at getting her agenda through, will be worse off. Um, one advantage of using this global approach is that since uh, so many of um, Inacon and the current DOJ stuff has gotten shot down in court. We, we, we can't just look domestically and say, okay, what, what happened subsequent to their policy succeeding? We're looking at a whole range of countries and saying, what happened when policies like theirs did go through and get implemented? And the answer is that it's just bad for your country's economy. And uh, Neil, if you want to touch on that, but also, you know, what kind of new technologies? Right? There's, there's so many applications uh, to AI, medical, military, consumer, right? You know, how does that kind of ro uh, robust antitrust enforcement perhaps, you know, uh, cut off new new technologies and new products for consumers? Uh, well, so. Uh... It's hard to know exactly. I mean, so the, it, it, it's the, the big challenge is it's the, the problem of the unseen, right? Like yeah. when, we, when we cut off economic activity, it's very hard to look back and say like what we didn't have um, because we don't have it. And so we can't really compare it to anything. 
Um, so that's why a study like yours is very useful because it shows like in some big macro numbers what the what the outcomes are. Um, but but what I can say more is like how founders can think how founders think about this stuff. Um, and I think what we're seeing right now is a uh, it used to be very clear that Silicon Valley um, did not spend a ton of time thinking about antitrust law. I'll, I'll just put it that way. They were building things, right, for the most part. Yeah. And so um, now it seems like every founder has to think about it. And a lot of them are thinking about it as, uh, as a real threat to them being able to sell their company and move on to a new project. And when you look at, um, when you look at innovation, and especially the US model for this, which is the world leader easily uh, in, in this type of innovation, uh, the people who come up with and build those early stage startups and develop a new technology are, are rarely, not never, but rarely the, the same people who can take that to scale and deliver products to consumers. And so some of the most successful deployments of real benefit to consumers come from taking a new company with a new idea and providing scale to it through a, uh, a company that already has a well-established brand and a bunch of mechanisms to bring to deliver something to consumers. And so, um, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of people in DC who, are, who look at the, the Facebook um, uh, Instagram merger with disdain, but like, and they think that, well, Instagram probably would have gotten just as well. But like, when you look at the change that Instagram experienced post that merger, um, being able to take advantage of the scale and the capacity uh, and the infrastructure that Facebook had, um, it's not at all obvious that without that merger that Instagram would have grown up to be anything like it looks now. And so, um, uh, so I think there's lots of examples of that. Uh, and, and so merger policy has a real big ef effect on that. Uh, outside of that, the, some of the conduct cases, you know, those are more in the weeds. They're more like one-offs. It depends on what the company's doing. And so I think like it's harder. There's a less clear lesson from that. Um, but any time that, uh, to me, any time an entrepreneur is spending time talking to their lawyer rather than building products for consumers, it's, you know, it's a little bit of a... Uh, downside. It's definitely a cost to that. I'm not saying they should never do it as a lawyer. I'm, I'm okay with them talking to me. But, um, but it's definitely, there are some real costs that come just from the uncertainty where somebody has to spend a lot of their time uh, and, their, and maybe their, their capital um, worrying about legal issues rather than building products for consumers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned right startups because, uh, you know, mergers are a great way for startups to exit and, and I know a lot of us here at CI have been talking about Sarbanes-Oxley a lot too and how difficult the federal government has made it for these new startups to go public. Uh, and really their only option is to, to exit by, by getting acquired. Uh, I, I wanna mention a couple specific examples and then get into you know, the international implications of this. Uh, on, NVIDIA recently announced the purchase of Run AI. It's an Israeli visualization of graphic profit processing unit company, uh, which allows customers to do more uh, with less chips, um, right? And then Joe mentioned uh, NVIDIA's attempted acquisition of ARM uh, was a, two years ago, 2021, three years ago now. Um, and Run AI is an Israeli company and ARM is a uh, British company, right? Two strong, I think, military uh, uh, allies to the United States. So, uh, Joe, you, you write a lot about kind of like our competition with China here yes. um, in the in the national security implications here. You know, just get, lay us on here. Like, how important is all this to um, U.S.'s geopolitical competitiveness, particularly when it comes to China? Um, quite important. I mean, if you ask the uh, generals, both current and former, a lot of them are writing about this, that the wars of the future are going to be determined by systems that run largely on AI. And to go back to our previous example of the internal combustion engine, um, between 1915 and 1935, even 1940, big debate amongst the generals about whether the horse or the tank would, would be the future of cavalry. And it wasn't obvious. Um, believe it or not, it was a pretty serious debate because people were, were debating whether the uh, supply chains to tanks were too complex, 
Um, but obviously, it was very important that the U.S. and its allies were very good at having tanks, kind of like 1939. And so I think similarly to the extent that all this um, antitrust enforcement is slowing down the overall rate of innovation in AI and the, the downstream systems in, in countries like the U.S., Holland, the U.K., Israel, it has profound consequences for U.S. national security. You obviously won't know that until it's too late. And that's kind of the scary part, is I think that it's one of those things where it's not obvious that the harm will be there, but the risk that it is is pretty terrifying. Um, so I think that's another setting where um, hard to quantify costs are pretty real. Um, and and I just put in the contrast of all this, right, I don't, China's currently not hampering their industries uh, no. on, on, no, no. on this front, are they? No, they, I mean, the, the Chinese model, as I understand it, is they give big subsidies to the entire sector, pretty much. I'm not a China expert, but it does not resemble the current FTC and DOJ at all. And uh, Neil, I'd like to throw you in, and I'd like to talk about the EU as well, right? Because uh, what exactly is China doing in the EU market, as we know, European Union does not have much of a tech sector. Uh, they have Spotify, but I, I'm not sure those are going to have any huge implications moving forward. Uh, can you talk about the, the EU a little bit, and, and, and particularly in, in the globes of geopolitical importance? Sure. Um, but let, let me take a step back and just add add on to the uh, the sort of China point. Uh, outside of the military implications, um, you know, much of the way uh, I've I talked a little bit about the fact that there's these big, expensive to train models. Uh, right now, the U.S. makes the best ones, right? And they are imbued with U.S. values in many ways and the values of U.S. companies. And uh, China, however, is making very big uh, large language models as well. Um, and they are, one way that they are hampering uh, that industry is that they are very specific about what kinds of things can and can't come out of those models as far as content. Um, they want it to sort of line up with uh, the CCP's views, uh, especially around you know, certain very touchy uh, topics to the CCP. And so, so when we think about international competition, it's not just a military competition. Part of it is how are people, like what models are people gonna use uh, to, to do their daily work? Are they gonna use ones that carry American values in them? Or are they gonna use ones that carry other? Uh, other entities' values in them. And so uh, where, where, China, where Europe fits into this picture is that um, Europe has passed a series of laws, uh, DSA, the DMA, the AI Act. Um, several of those have thresholds that seem to cut off like just under the, the, U, the largest US companies, right? And so they very much are, and they have a history of, of, of targeting US companies for violations of these laws, and I expect that to continue. Um, that means, uh, that means that US companies some are already starting to not deliver certain types of products to Europe. Uh, we saw Apple decline to roll out uh, its Apple uh, intelligence. Uh, Meta declined to roll out its latest multimodal uh, open source model um, in Europe. And out of concerns, regulatory concerns, I think quite rightly, uh, somebody's gonna step into that gap uh, and I expect the Chinese will step into that gap. And uh, so China, so Europe will be in this weird situation where they are coming after American companies, using them as a piggy bank, and then China is selling them uh, open source or selling them uh, AI models that, that Europe is running on. And I, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good for Europe. Um, it's, I don't think it's good for the world. Uh, um, and, and so uh, I, I worry about that. And so, at the bare minimum, the U.S. should not be entering letters with all the European regulators saying that U.S. companies are posing competitive threats. The bare minimum, that's what they should be doing. I think they should be much more aggressive and be and use some of our trade authority to say, like, "Hey, Europe, like, quit picking on our our companies. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense. Why are you passing all these laws to do this?" And 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 so um, uh, and then you know, I, I think that would be. It might take a little bit more pain. I mean, maybe some more companies need to stop delivering products over there and see what happens. Yeah, it's it's interesting also in the scope of national security, we have 
these Chinese companies like Huawei, we have TikTok, right? And we're, we're, we're told about all these national security threats that they, they pose. Um, and then yet we, you know, we hamper our own technology, you know, that could hopefully overtake that. It's almost like a, a, a national security solution is free markets. Yeah. Right. Great. Well, I'd like to give each of our panelists a last word on this, right? The title of this event is A Global Antitrust Paradox, or maybe I should do it with an inflection, A Global Antitru Antitrust Paradox. <laughs> uh, so I want to, you know, give each of you a few minutes, a couple minutes to just give us our, your, what's your big takeaway from this? What should we get from this, um, you know, this, this antitrust enforcement of, of new nascent technology and AI. Joe, I'll give it to you first. Sure, um, I guess my big takeaway would be that in the 20th century, you had, of course, uh, Judge Bork's The Antitrust Paradox, and I'm not a lawyer, but my impression is a lot of people in the antitrust space still conceptualize of antitrust as about domestic economic outcomes. What share of the pie do workers get versus corporations? Um, but I think with, with the advent of globalization, certainly since the 80s, when Judge Bork first coined the term. Um, we have to look at America as a whole versus other countries. So not just domestically framing it as workers versus corporations, but American companies versus Chinese companies, US workers versus Chinese workers. And I think there, the case that stringent antitrust is bad for the US as a whole is pretty compelling. Um, in a way that I tried to document with real numbers empirically and I think I, my hope is that it moves the antitrust debate from this sort of moralistic space of how much of, of, of GDP should go to workers versus corporations to one of what are US interests as a whole um, and sort of away from a zero sum conception of the US economy and, and more towards positive some conception of what are America's interests now in the 21st century, given that globalization is real and that the technologies of the future um, are those that are being most scrutinized right now by the DOJ and the FTC. So I guess my punchline from the paper was the FTC and DOJ's agenda is a bad idea that it, that could not come at a worse time. So it's not that these costs were never present. It, it, it's that the stakes of the costs and what they mean has gotten higher with time. Um, so that's, that, that, that was a bit long-winded, but that would, would be my takeaway. Um, and Neil, final words? Uh, so big picture, antitrust is not Antitrust is a very big, blunt tool. It is not a tool for remaking society and solving all of society's problems. Yes. It needs to be constrained and focused on one thing, which is making consumers better off. And innovation right. uh, makes consumers better off, especially disruptive innovation. And to dive into a space that's as vibrant as AI right now and say, hey, we're going to bring down this hammer on people. Um, before we even really know what this uh, industry is going to look like, uh, is just fundamentally anti-consumer, and I think it's it is it's bad for it's bad for consumers, and I think that means it's bad for America, um, and and I think that means it's good for our international competitors. I guess I'll use that that word. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. I'd like to thank our panelists for being here today, Joe and Neil. I really enjoyed having this conversation. I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I'd also like to thank our lovely event staff, IT staff, everyone. Y'all just make these things uh, super easy. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you, CEI, for uh, allowing me to do this. So thank you.